today, we got a really interesting video. We're going to be breaking down H.G. Wells' Island of Dr. Moreau like never before. This video is part of a series, so if you haven't already, I recommend that you start with the previous three videos. You can find them in our alt film history playlist, and we'll be referring to these videos throughout so you don't want to miss out on those. We're going to be talking about the secret of Dr. Moreau and whether or not this whole story is truly just science fiction. So strap in and get ready because it's about to get pretty wild. So where do we start? Well, I've read the 1896 first edition, watched all three movies, including a fourth previously lost German version that was rediscovered in the last decade. So I got a lot to say on this, and we can now compare and contrast to see how the story has developed over the last century. First, let me catch you up to speed with the original novel. Give you the spark notes real quick because in order to understand the secret, we really have to start there. Now keep in mind, we're exploring secrets here, covert experiments, clandestine truths. If you're seeking concrete, officially validated evidence, you'll have to broaden your perspective. Unofficial, hidden truths rarely come with an authoritative stamp of approval. If you can suspend your disbelief, we can start our journey into the lesser known. So, who is H.G. Wells? Widely recognized as one of the greatest science fiction writers of his era, his name often appears alongside legends like Jules Verne. But is there more to this story? We'll dig into that soon. A less known fact about Wells is his background in science, and he was a student of the famous eugenicist Thomas Huxley, grandfather of Aldous Huxley, author of Brave New World. Could these grand scientific minds be a part of a covert agenda to shape the future through science fiction, or perhaps to subtly reveal secret plans? With Wells, War of the Worlds, a symbolic tug of war between the elite and humanity, this idea doesn't seem too far-fetched. It's not about aliens, that's just a superficial error. This was demonstrated in 1938 with a radio show adaptation of the novel that listeners believed to be a real invasion. Bizarre, right? Or are these novels a calculated move to embed a certain kind of propaganda into our society? A type of secret symbolism? Perhaps even programming? Think this is all nonsense? Consider this. Wells was a part of the Fabian Society, their emblem being a wolf in sheep's clothing. This society is open about its intent to influence society and create a new world order, aligning with another of Wells' works. They aim for societal transformation through slow progression, not by force, lulling us into accepting their doctrine on our own, thereby avoiding the label of tyranny. Is it possible that H.G. Wells was a part of an elite club, acting as a mouthpiece to subtly program societal norms, or to drape historical truths in a veneer of fantasy or science fiction, pushing certain facts into the realm of conspiracy? Well, let's get right to it. So the novel, The Island of Dr. Moreau, was first published in 1896, well over a century ago. What we're trying to do with this video is explore whether or not there are any clues to early genetic experiments, creation of hybrids, or even references to the homunculus in these works. If we find anything, it might just prove that the accepted history of Chimera research isn't quite accurate. Remember, we're dealing with the world of secrets here. So let's dive in. So our main protagonist of the story, Edward Prendick, survives a shipwreck somewhere in the southern Pacific Ocean and floats in a dinghy with three other men. They basically go insane, and Prendick is laughing as they fall off the boat or something along these lines. Just as he's about to bite the bullet, a ship picks him up. Montgomery, the ship's doctor, revives him. Prendick soon realizes he's landed on a floating zoo, filled with various animals, including a strangely out-of-place puma. Things get a bit hairy on the ship with a drunk and grouchy captain and a disturbed crew. There's a blackface character, Emmeling, who's part of Montgomery's crew. Emmeling is not quite human with features that give Prendick nightmares. The ship eventually docks at an island, and here's where it gets really interesting. At the start of the novel, it reveals the island's coordinates, naming it Noble's Island. The ship's cargo and animals are unloaded, but our protagonist isn't quite as lucky. Both the irate captain and a new white-haired island dweller refuse to let him stay leaving him to drift on a dinghy again. When the island's inhabitants, these odd brown faces, see Prendick in danger, 
they persuade Montgomery to save him. Once on the island, Prendick encounters more deformed assistants that he describes as grotesque and disturbing. Oh, and this is interesting. Prendick, like Wells himself, studied under Huxley at the Royal College of Science. When he reveals this, even Dr. Moreau raises an eyebrow. So if Prendick and Wells share the same background, perhaps they're one and the same? Moreau refers to the island as a sort of biological station, and soon after, Montgomery tasked Prendick with releasing rabbits to breed and multiply, symbolizing the hidden procreative nature of the island, but also the rabbit hole journey we're about to undertake. Next, our unexpected guest, Prendick, is locked up in a room, surrounded by a library filled with old surgical works, Latin and Greek classics. A tantalizing hint, maybe? But that's not it, it gets wilder. Prendick gets ahead of the past when he hears Montgomery calling for Moreau. The name jogs his memory, but it's only when he starts to connect the strange, deformed man he met on the beach to the name Moreau that the puzzle pieces start to fit. One man even had fur and pointed ears. It all snaps into place when he recalls a pamphlet, boldly titled, The Moreau Horrors. This memory from his youth comes rushing back. Moreau, he remembers, was a big name in the scientific community, celebrated for his trailblazing ideas and blunt demeanor. This Moreau had done groundbreaking work on blood transfusion and pathological growths before he was suddenly ousted from England. A journalist obtained access to his laboratory in the capacity of a laboratory assistant with the deliberate intention of making sensational exposures. And then it says by the help of an accident, if it was an accident, his gruesome pamphlet became notorious. This is particularly fascinating because it mirrors the very essence of the novel itself, as it's also supposed to be some type of sensational story to support animal rights and be against vivisection. But think about it. Prendick is considering at this point in the novel whether it really was all just hype or a fake story, or whether there was any truth to the articles written on Moreau. We know that H.G. Wells is a part of the club, so is this a novel about how this is actually based on real-world events, as they are discussing real scientific issues of the time, the overall goal being to then move the secret history into a new realm, a new world, the reality of science fiction. Prendick remembers the journalist branding Moreau's experiments as excessively cruel. With that memory, the dots start to connect. The odd creatures, the medicinal smell, and finally the terrified animal screams but what could be so horrible about vivisection that it needed to be cloaked in such secrecy? So it even tells you in the book, this is all a secret experiment. While Prendick is locked away, this chapter unveils Moreau as a sort of mad vivisector. He was a figure of renown within the scientific community, but was forced to abandon his homeland due to potential investigations into his controversial studies and laboratory practices. Now the key is that it says it was just a sensational story, but the main character is going to slowly discover the truth of the situation. Vivisection, for those who don't know, involves experimenting on live animals, from the Latin vivis, alive, and sectio, cutting. During the time when The Island of Dr. Moreau was written in 1896, this practice sparked serious controversy. While it led to significant advances in medicine, it also stirred up a lot of ethical debates. Back in the 19th century, vivisection played a key role in understanding anatomy, pathology, and physiology. Many medical breakthroughs, including the development of anesthesia, were thanks to vivisection. But these advancements came at a price. Public opinion increasingly veered towards viewing vivisection as an inhumane, morally indefensible practice, regardless of its benefits. Moreau's disturbing experiments as depicted in the novel supposedly critiqued unchecked scientific exploration. But what if the truth was twisted? What if this narrative was a way to hide the real history of these experiments? The Cruelty to Animals Act of 1876 in the UK was a significant move towards regulating these practices, requiring experimenters to be licensed and undergo regular inspections. Given all this, you have to wonder, is the island of Dr. Moreau really a work of science fiction, or is it more historical than we've been led to believe? The lines, it seems, are starting to blur. 
Okay, so on to the next chapter. While Montgomery won't explain to Prendick anything about his assistant with the pointy ears and pretends not to notice anything at all, which makes him even more suspicious. Interrupting their conversation are the animal screams so unsettling that Prendick opts to leave the house and explore the forest. During his exploration, Prendick encounters one of the island's inhabitants, behaving animalistically and drinking from a stream with his mouth. Despite his beast-like demeanor, this man is clothed, not savage, stirring confusion with Prendick about his initial impression of these islanders. Further exploration leads him to a decapitated rabbit, a discovery that fills him with unease and prompts his return to the beach enclosure. Before he can leave, he comes across three grotesque human figures engaging in a peculiar chant or dance. Despite their human form, they bear an unmistakable swinish taint, a mark of the beast. This reference is no mere coincidence, the novel is interspersed with veiled references to Satanism and cult worship. The Mark of the Beast serves as a multi-layered symbol, playing with themes of godliness and Satanism. As Prendick retreats, one creature follows him, instigating a fight which Prendick manages to end using a stone. Despite the still echoing cries of the puma, he makes it back to the house. Montgomery, alarmed yet still evasive, continues to dodge Prendick's questions. Drawn by a human-like cry of pain, Prendick stumbles upon a bandaged figure bound to a framework, with a blood-covered Moreau present. Moreau thrusts Prendick back into his room, leaving him alone with this growing horror of the human vivisection taking place on the island. Now to comment for a second, notice how this revolves around vivisection and not genetic manipulation. That is the key difference that we'll discuss in a moment. Okay, in the next chapter, Prendick is convinced that Moreau has been vivisecting humans, and he believes that these strange creatures on the island are the result of these experiments, combining both human and animal parts together. Now he believes he's up next. Armed with a makeshift weapon, he flees into the jungle, contemplating suicide but decides to push through. An ape-like creature, capable of basic English and friendly, descends from a tree and guides Prendick to his home in the deep forest. Entering a cavern, the ape man introduces Prendick to the other beast folk. Noticing Prendick's five fingers, the ape man labels him as a five man like himself. To survive among the beast folk, Prendick must adhere to the law. This law, chanted in a ritualistic manner by a nearly faceless gray creature known as the Sayer of the Law, is revealed to be a means of suppressing the beast folk's animalistic tendencies. Violations of the law lead to transformations back to their animal forms. One law prohibits the consumption of flesh to maintain their human likeness. Offenders are sent to the House of Pain or Hell, subjected to painful alterations in the same lab that they were created. The laws function as social control, enabling Moreau, their godlike figure, to maintain order. The law can be viewed as mind control or indoctrination, akin to cults or secret societies. The beast folk's ritualistic chanting and blind adherence to the law could be perceived as a critique of religious dogma or blind faith. Upon Moreau's arrival, he commands the beast folk to capture Prendick. However, Prendick manages to evade them. Continuing, rather than taking his own life, the protagonist Prendick chooses to confront Moreau and Montgomery. As he walks into the sea to evade them, they follow, encouraging him to return ashore. Prendick threatens to drown himself, choosing death over becoming the subject of Moreau's gruesome experiments. Moreau and Montgomery, however, deny any intention to harm him, trying to convince him that they're not as nefarious as he believes. Prendick accuses the pair of morphing men into beast, an allegation Moreau counters by asserting that the creatures were always animals and that his work merely humanizes them. Disputing this, Prendick points out that the creatures build houses and communicate verbally, signs that they were once human. Moreau, however, holds firm in his argument, maintaining that the creatures are simply evolved animals. Prendick also alleges that Moreau set the beast upon him, to which Moreau clarifies that they were only trying to bring him back to safety. Despite his skepticism, Prendick decides to give them the benefit of the doubt and returns to shore. The chapter concludes with Prendick observing the beastmen, intrigued by their attempts to think, a behavior he has never before seen in animals. 
Interestingly, Moreau's assertion that he's humanizing animals is steeped in irony, given that his experiments seem to do just the opposite, strip humans of their humanity. But we'll delve deeper into this paradox shortly. For now, it's enough to comprehend that, according to Moreau, the process involves turning animals into humans, not the reverse. Now we get to the most important part of the book, so listen up. In chapter 14, called Dr. Moreau Explains, we get the secret of the book. Deciding to shed light on the mysterious happenings of the island, Moreau elects to lay everything bare to Prendick. Due to the unfortunate circumstances that have landed Prendick on the island, Moreau believes that this revelation could serve as a form of assistance or perhaps even a release for him. This appears to be Moreau's last-ditch effort to dissuade Prendick from suicide, though it's unclear how this exposition serves to assuage his fears. Moreau first leads Prendick to acknowledge that the being subject to gruesome experimentation in the lab, the source of the distressing screams, was indeed just a puma. Upon seeing the creature's body, Prendick concurs that it wasn't human, but a puma. However, the animal is so mangled and mutilated that the sight of it impels Prendick to wish never to witness such repugnant flesh again. Brushing Prendick's discomfort aside, Moreau urges him to focus and prepare for a physiological lecture. In this enlightening session, Moreau reveals the crux of his work to Prendick. Our protagonist comes to the chilling realization that the beings he encountered on the island were never men, nor had they ever been human. Instead, they were humanized animals, products of Moreau's extensive vivisection. Moreau asserts, quote, You forget all that a skilled vivisector can do with living things. End quote. Moreau even states that he is puzzled why these experiments have not been done before, meaning that it's logical to conclude that they have. He continues by acknowledging past efforts in medical science like amputations and excisions. He posits that even a squint can be surgically induced or cured. He talks about a plethora of secondary changes brought about by surgery, like pigmentary disturbances, modification of passions, alterations in the secretion of fatty tissue, and queries if Prendick has heard of such advancements. Prendick concedes knowledge of these procedures, but remains perplexed about the creatures. Moreau placates him, assuring that all will be revealed in due time. Emphasizing that surgery's scope extends beyond mere modifications, Moreau highlights its potential in constructive procedures. For instance, he mentions the procedure of repositioning a destroyed nose through surgical intervention. In this critical section, Moreau goes further to discuss the concept of grafting in more detail, delving into its intricate potentialities. He expounds on how there are procedures where one's organ or piece of flesh can be accepted by the same body when rearranged in a different configuration through surgery. This introduces the notion that the human body is not a fixed structure, but a malleable form that can be rearranged to achieve desired outcomes. He encapsulates this idea by asserting, quote, a kind of grafting in a new position of part of an animal upon itself, end quote. Continuing his exposition, Moreau points out that grafting freshly obtained material from another animal is also feasible. He cites the example of teeth to illustrate his point, proposing that the grafting of skin and bone can facilitate the healing process. As part of this procedure, the surgeon might place pieces of skin taken from another animal or fragments of bone from a freshly killed victim in the middle of the wound. This intricate explanation showcases the broad spectrum of what grafting can do, ultimately underscoring the scientific principle that the body is capable of accepting its own rearranged flesh and organs. This revelation adds a new dimension to Moreau's vivisection experiments, providing a chilling insight into the seemingly limitless potential of surgical manipulation. Moreau then brings up the example of Hunter's cockspur. Possibly you have heard that? Flourished on the bull's neck, and the rhinoceros rats of the Algerian zouaves are also to be thought of monsters manufactured by transferring a slip from the tail of an ordinary rat to its snout and allowing it to heal in that position. Okay, wait, hold up. So do you see what he's doing here? This is the historical novel style, where they actually back up the story with real world facts to make it more scary. This is not just a made up sci-fi novel. They aren't flying rockets to Mars. 
Instead, it's a harrowing exploration to the grim history of surgical experimentation, where the only limit to what could be achieved was the depths of the surgeon's imagination. It's a well-known fact that skin can indeed be altered through surgery and one's own skin could be rearranged in any form that the skilled, dark, twisted scientist can imagine. That is what Moreau is really talking about. Because remember, the story evolves over time in the modern day to be about genetic DNA manipulation experiments, or the creation of hybrids, but that's not the full picture. It's actually all about medieval surgery, the dark art of creating monsters, or the creation of chimeras. Upon hearing Moreau's unsettling revelations, Prendick exclaims, Monsters manufactured. Moreau calmly affirms, saying, Yes, these creatures you have seen are animals carven and wrought into new shapes. To that, to the study of the plasticity of living forms, my life has been devoted. Hmm, plasticity of living forms. Let's take note of that. He is a sculptor using human flesh essentially. He uses surgery to manipulate animals into a human form. Moreau tells Prendick, You look horrified and yet I'm telling you nothing new. This was all revealed from practical anatomy years ago. It was just that no one had the temerity to touch it. Moreau goes further to state, quote, It's not simply the outward form of an animal which I can change. The physiology, the chemical rhythm of the creature, may also be made to undergo an enduring modification. This is where it gets interesting, and I'm not going to say the word, but Moreau essentially brings up how he can use inoculation as a method in which they can alter the chemical rhythm of the animal. So hold up, what does this imply? Moreau is hinting at two monumental possibilities. One, he can surgically alter the skin ligaments, and overall shape of an animal into any form he wishes, and two, he can induce changes at a molecular level, effectively altering the animal's chemical rhythm, an early hint at genetic manipulation. He explains that by adjusting an animal's chemical rhythm via specific injections, one could prompt it to mimic the chemical processes of another creature. Coupled with grafting and surgical manipulation, one could in theory, craft any creature one desires. Moreau confirms this by referring to blood transfusion, a practice that dates back to 1665 in England. Physician Richard Lauer revived a dog he purposely bled to death by transfusing it with blood from another dog. Even more shocking, two years later, Jean-Baptiste Denis, King Louis XIV's personal physician, transfused sheep's blood into a 15-year-old boy and a laborer, both of whom reportedly survived the procedures. So we're talking about a form of chemical change here. If you give one animal the blood of another, it's a kind of primitive cell exchange that doesn't require sophisticated gene editing tools. It's just introducing one organism's cells into another's body. This process basically creates an organism with mixed cellular origins. In biology, a chimera refers to an organism made up of cells from two or more different zygotes, leading to different sets of DNA. This unique creature gets its name from the chimera of Greek mythology, a hybrid creature that was part lion, part goat, and part serpent. Chimeras can happen naturally in nature. For example, in some twins where cells from one twin get incorporated into the other during early development stages. In scientific research and medicine, Chimeras can be created artificially. The purpose behind this can vary. It can be for studying developmental processes, modeling diseases, or even for potential treatments like stem cell therapy and organ transplantation. We have other terms like xenotransfusions and xenotransplants used in the modern scientific community. These refer to the processes of transferring blood or blood products, xenotransfusion, or organs or tissues, xenotransplantation, from one species to another. In essence, the recipient becomes a biological chimera, hosting cells from both their own species and the donor species either temporarily or permanently. The concept of xenotransfusion was introduced by a French monk, Dom Robert Descabets, at a scientific society meeting in 1658. This society eventually became the French Academy of Sciences. 
So who's to say that this procedure wasn't known even earlier? This could suggest that Chimera research has its roots dating back to the mid-17th century. Now, one might argue that transfusing blood from another animal won't create a chimeric creature. However, Moreau uses this as a foundation, a single example illustrating how the chemical structure of an animal can be altered. He's presenting historical facts. Another interesting concept is cellular memory, the theory that memories, behaviors, or preferences could be transferred from the donor to the recipient in an organ transplant. A prominent example of this phenomena is the case of Claire Sylvia, a New England actress who received a heart and lung transplant in the 1980s. She reported significant changes in her taste preferences, habits, and even personality. After tracking down her donor, she found some of the traits she inherited matched his preferences. Now, let's apply this concept to animals in the context of xenotransfusion or xenotransplants. We start to see how these experiments might date back to medieval times. Their acceptance as a modern field of research is largely due to immunosuppressant drugs, but it's mainly for organ implants. Now, considering that drugs modulating the immune system have been studied for thousands of years, it might not be far-fetched to assume that the history of this practice could be much older. Much like the alchemist's secret formula for gold transmutation, a practice of this magnitude would be heavily veiled in secrecy. It's possible that medieval physicians could have developed an advanced method of grafting and transplanting organs, including skin, from various different creatures. They may have had a secret potion or mixture to suppress the immune system and force the subject to accept body parts from different species. I mean, if you look at the alchemist's works, they consistently depict chimeric-like beings in their secret symbolic formulas. So is it really that far-fetched? And don't forget, we've already delved into ancient grafting in our previous video on the miracle of the black leg. This tale from over 1500 years ago unfolds the extraordinary act of transplanting a moor's leg onto a white body. The Christian saints in this early period were highly skilled in alchemy and medicine, and these two saints from this tale were even stoned and crucified for their practices. This account of the transplantation of the black leg is corroborated by several historical authors and might just be the evidence we need to support the existence of ancient surgical procedures that were kept under secrecy. It's reported that they used special instruments and a unique ointment to help the recipient's body accept the foreign tissue. Was this knowledge lost and had to be rediscovered during the Dark Ages? Moreau, however, isn't done with his revelations. He says these blood transfusions experiments are well known, but there exist lesser known cases that were probably even more extensive. Quote, the operations of those medieval practitioners who made dwarfs and beggar cripples show monsters some vestiges of whose art still remain in the preliminary manipulation of the young mountebank or contortionist." End quote. Moreau explains, quote, Victor Hugo gives an account of them in L'Homme Guerri, end quote. Hold on. So Moreau is citing a real-world book by Victor Hugo within this story, indicating some similarities. Moreau labels this as a largely lost art which echoes the theme of Victor Hugo's book, The Man Who Laughs, written in 1869. Moreau uses this book to substantiate his argument that these experiments have historical roots. This reference to Victor Hugo led us to delve into his work. In The Man Who Laughs, we stumble upon a secret history of a group of gypsies who trafficked children to create show monsters for the nobility. This shocking history reveals the creation of grotesque creatures through medieval surgeries, even mentioning a stupefying powder used as an early anesthetic to subdue the victims. Here, in this chapter, Dr. Moreau seems to use this as evidence for the historical basis of these chilling chimeric procedures. Just like H.G. Wells, Hugo also employs a writing style that incorporates historical truths. In this case, a real-world book that, like Moreau's work, is a historical novel rather than a science fiction or fantasy piece. 
It appears H.G. Wells deliberately incorporated this reference into the book as a clue. If you follow this lead, it opens up an entirely new area of study. But this isn't the only breadcrumb. There's another hint we'll uncover at the end of the book. What we're dealing with here is secrecy, multiple authors, and experiments that are controversial in scientific circles. Plus, there are several symbols linked to occult societies within this novel. Perhaps this was an attempt to reveal certain hidden truths to the public? Well, Moreau discusses this. Quote, you begin to see that it is possible to transplant tissue from one part of an animal to another, or from one animal to another, to alter its chemical reactions and methods of growth, to modify the articulation of its limbs, and, indeed, to change it in its most intimate structure. Yet, this remarkable branch of knowledge has never been pursued systematically by modern investigators until I took it up. Such things have been discovered in the last resort of surgery, most of the similar evidence that might come to your mind has been unveiled by accident, by tyrants, by criminals, by horse and dog breeders, by all kinds of untrained, clumsy hand individuals working for their immediate ends. I was the first man to address this question equipped with antiseptic surgery and a truly scientific understanding of the laws of growth. Yet, one would surmise it must have been practiced secretly beforehand. End quote. So there it is. He claims to be the first in his era to revisit this practice, yet he acknowledges it must have been performed in the past in secret. We're thus talking about procedures that are secretive even in a historical context. How can we trust the mainstream narrative that xenotransplants or even the artificial creation of chimeras through fetal manipulation are purely modern phenomena, when as early as 1896, Notions like these were published? Shouldn't we question whether such events actually occurred? Especially when we consider Victor Hugo's work. Morel goes on to mention entities like the Siamese twins and the vaults of the Inquisition. Quote, no doubt their primary aim was artistic torture, but some of the inquisitors much have had a touch of scientific curiosity. End quote. To Moreau's revelations, Prendick replies, but they can talk. Moreau counters, explaining that vivisection isn't restricted to mere physical transformation. He postulates that even a pig could be strangely educated. Moreau also discusses the mental manipulation of animals as a sort of grafting of ideas, thereby altering their thinking pattern, an apparent form of hypnosis. Then he appears to critique religion, noting similarities between moral education and the artificial modification and perversion of instinct. Just as Victor Hugo mentioned, Moreau discusses the operations of the larynx, explaining how modifications can help animals form different sound symbols to facilitate thought. When Prendick questions why Moreau chose the human form, sensing something wicked in this decision, Moreau claims it was merely by chance, and that he could transform any animal into any other creature he wished. Prendick challenges Moreau, asking how can he inflict such pain? Moreau responds with a rant, declaring that unlike Prendick, he isn't a materialist and that he stands above pain, which he asserts is a trait of the animalistic side of beings. Moreau then seems to lose his composure and stabs his own leg with a small blade, continuing his tirade by arguing that pain merely serves as an intrinsic medical advisor, warning and stimulating us. He proceeds to say that plants don't feel pain and neither do lower animals like starfish and crayfish. Moreau is attempting to assert that in the grand scheme of evolution, pain is irrelevant and unnecessary. He claims that he's a religious man, having sought out his own laws, and tells Prennick that pain and pleasure have no relevance to heaven and hell. He even draws a comparison with Mahomet's Ori, intriguingly followed by his assertion to Prennick that the mark of the beast is upon them, the mark of the beast from whence they came. So he's positing that pleasure and pain are one and the same and that they constitute the mark of the beast, synonymous with materialism, a snare of this lower, dusty realm. Moreau's discourse appears to align with Ophite Gnosticism, which further ties this narrative to secret societies. Moreau continues, explaining that his research simply followed the path it carved out. He would pose a question, devise a method to find an answer, and that would then give rise to a new question 
was this or that possible? Here, Moreau attempts to frame his actions as merely the intellectual pursuit of answers. However, his disregard for the value of life and the souls of other living beings becomes glaringly evident. He even says in this very paragraph that the creature before you is no longer an animal or a fellow creature, but merely a problem. Thus, Moreau overlooks the crucial aspect here. He doesn't perceive these creatures as sentient beings, but merely as variables in his experiment or puzzle. This chapter gives off a tone strikingly similar to Hugo's work, as if it's the same madman at the helm. You're left with two possibilities. Either this narrative is based on a grain of historical truth, or it's entirely fabricated. In the latter case, you'd have to fathom the levels of insanity required to conjure these concepts during this era and publish them as such culturally influential pieces of literature. Either way, it's utterly shocking to consider. Moreau outlines his primary objective, which is to determine the extreme limit of plasticity in a living shape. We should bear this in mind for later. He then details his initial experiments. He began by transforming a sheep into a humanoid form, but was horrified when it retained the mentality of a sheep. Hmm, interesting. The creature's clumsiness intensified, and ultimately, he had to euthanize it to end its misery. Next, he moved on to a gorilla. He explains how he molded this creature, a process reminiscent of the controversial practice of bonsai children, and also echoing the notion of brain molding for thought programming. At this point, H.G. Wells reveals racial undertones in the book. Having transformed the gorilla into a humanoid form, Moreau states that the resulting creature bore negroid features. He taught this creation English and remarks that the creature started with a blank slate, mentally, with no recollection of its previous existence, much like the effects of the stupefying powder from Victor Hugo. He tested his creation by introducing it to the island's missionaries. Initially frightened, they slowly accepted the creature. Moreau was about to write a letter to England detailing his work when he noticed the creature reverting to its original animalistic behaviors. Here, Moreau admits that his creations tend to regress. Beastly characteristics re-emerge after his interventions, a process he has no control over. Moreau recounts an especially bizarre experiment that led to a missionary's death. He created numerous humanoid creatures, and on one occasion, a thing. This creature, akin to a limbless serpentine monstrosity with a horrifying face, killed several missionaries and animals. It was evasive until Montgomery managed to shoot it. From creating human-like beings to literal monsters, Moreau's experiments took on horrific dimensions. He decided to stick to the human form thereafter, except for some unspecified little things. According to Moreau, he's been conducting these experiments for 20 years, including 9 years in England. He confesses one persistent challenge, although he can mold the human form quite efficiently, making it graceful, sturdy, albeit occasionally problematic with the hands, he struggles with reshaping the brain. The intelligence of these creatures is consistently low, with peculiar gaps. Moreau surmises there are parts of the experiments he can't influence, deep emotions, instincts, and desires that reside in some obscure, untapped reservoir. Initially, his creations appear convincingly human. However, with time, animal instincts gradually resurface. This is where Moreau unveils his ultimate goal, to create a rational man, or essentially an artificial man, by converting an animal into a fully intelligent human being, a homunculus. This human is not product of a natural reproduction, it is a product of scientific manipulation conceived through experimentation. This chapter shines a light on early conceptions of genetic manipulation and the potential for altering the physical and mental structures of living beings. Moreau becomes a literal man-maker. He discusses grafting, the fusion of diverse living organisms, and by the chapter's end, we realize he's essentially talking about souls when he refers to emotions. Moreau claims to be able to see through souls. We'll revisit this chapter towards the end of the book, but there's still some key points to address before we can draw our conclusions. In a chapter titled, Concerning the Beast Folk, we gain deeper insight into Moreau's experiments, discovering that he's using techniques of mind control and hypnotism on the animals. 
The extent of detail provided is quite intriguing for a novel of its time. Moreau explains to Prendick that he and Montgomery are relatively safe from the animalistic creations due to the creature's limited mental capacities. Despite the animal's increased intelligence and the resurfacing of their instinctual behaviors, Moreau has successfully planted certain fixed ideas into their minds, which act as boundaries to their imagination. They are essentially hypnotized. Moreau and Montgomery have convinced them that certain things are impossible and other things are strictly forbidden. These prohibitions are so deeply woven into the fabric of their minds that disobedience or argument is nearly impossible. This manipulation is done by instilling the laws, which the creatures repeat like a hymn, echoing the potential of repetitive hymns or lullabies as devices of mind control to prevent individuals from questioning certain aspects of their reality. Moreover, Moreau and Montgomery introduced a law forbidding meat consumption to prevent the creatures from reverting to their animalistic behaviors. Montgomery discloses to Prendick that the island's population comprises more than 60 of these bizarre beings crafted by Moreau, not including the smaller creatures living in the undergrowth lacking human form. In total, Moreau has created nearly 120, but many have died, or, like the fullest thing, met violent ends. Interestingly, we learn that these creations can reproduce, but their offspring typically die. If they do survive, Moreau manipulates them into the human form. The creatures retain some characteristics of their original species, especially their heads, with the human mark distorting but not completely erasing the signs of their original form, whether it be a leopard, ox, sow, or any other animal. Their voices also significantly vary, and while their hands exhibit human traits, they are generally malformed with a lack of tactile sensibility. Among the most dangerous of these creatures are a man leopard and a beast made from a hyena and a pig. Other notable creatures include the silvery haired man, who is also the sayer of the law, the creature made from an ape and a goat, three swine men and a swine woman, and a mare rhinoceros creature, and various others of undisclosed origin. Interestingly, some of the inhabitants are referred to as youths, among them dappled ones and a small sloth-like creature. In this part, we learn that Montgomery sources his animals from Spanish mongrels in Africa. Interestingly, Moreau does indeed use multiple animals. We learn that Emling is made from multiple animals, so it's not just surgery on one animal, page 154. It was a complex trophy of Moreau's horrible skill, a bear tainted with dog and ox, and one of the most elaborately made of all his creatures. It treated Montgomery with a strange tenderness and devotion." End quote. In the chapter where Dr. Moreau explains his work, he portrays it as though he's simply operating on a single animal and transforming or sculpting it into another animal. But what he fails to elaborate on is he's actually incorporating parts from multiple animals, and perhaps even parts from humans. We're left to wonder if he's not also performing human blood transfusions on these animals to influence their biochemistry. This means these creatures aren't merely hybrids, they're chimeras. They aren't beast men as shown in the movies, simple hairy men, but they're bizarre, deformed beings that have been grafted into the human form using a combination of different animal parts. It's an absolutely horrifying visual that's even more gruesome than the concept of creating a hybrid through scientific means. Well, we now proceed to chapter 16, How the Beast Folk Taste Blood, which explores darker, perhaps symbolic themes. On page 157, Montgomery mentions pink offspring of the beast folk that could potentially serve as a food source. This is puzzling as it contradicts the law prohibiting the consumption of flesh, which is strictly observed by the beast folk. Yet, there is a mention that the beasts have latent cannibalistic tendencies. During a tour on the island, Prendick and Montgomery find a dead rabbit, signifying a violation of the law. Notably, the satyr a creature referenced from classical ancient history is described with Hebrew facial features and satanic attributes related to its lower body. This seems to intentionally blend occult symbolism with the narrative, drawing connections between the law-breaking beast folk and the symbolism of satanic rebellion. 
This chapter titled, How the Beast Folk Takes Blood, seems to be a metaphor for breaking the laws and societal norms. The reference to satanic can be interpreted as something pertaining to the devil. The narrative becomes even stranger with this reference, considering its context in a scientific horror story. The satyr, unlike other beast folk, is capable of laughter, an advanced expression of emotion and cognition that none of the other creatures exhibit. The word devil is used again on page 161, where Montgomery expresses doubt over Prendick's claim of finding a killed rabbit. On page 165, Moreau uses a horn to summon the beast folk, the first to appear being the satyr, another instance where Wells seems to use symbolism. Now this is mind-blowing. On page 193, there's the use of the term homunculus, an alchemical term referring to a miniature human or an artificially created human. If you haven't seen Homunculus Unveiled, make sure to check it out. But this is crazy that this book even mentions this, as it hints to Wells' knowledge of esoteric concepts and his deliberate incorporation of them into the story. This is further evidenced on page 195, where the beast folk engage in hymn recitation as a ritual, and it's mentioned that there are seven beastmen, another likely nod to alchemical principles. Okay, so let me quickly break down the rest of the story, and then there's a couple more things to note. Moreau, Montgomery, and Prendick discover that the beast folk have begun breaking the laws. They're eating flesh and transgressing other prohibitions. Moreau decides to make an example of the transgressor, and upon discovering it to be the leopard man, instigates a chase after the creature escapes his grasp. Prendick finds the leopard man first, and seeing the creature's fear and humanity, mercifully kills it before Moreau can subject it to further experimentation. Six weeks pass, with Moreau obsessively working on a new project, the Puma, and then it becomes clear that these creations of Moreau are not made in days, but rather over grueling months. The Puma, horribly mutilated and wrapped in bandages, eventually escapes and vanishes into the jungle. Chaos ensues among the beast folk as Moreau disappears, presumably killed. Prendick tries to maintain order by assuming the role of a deity, but is short-lived. Discovery of Moreau's mauled body beside the dead Puma confirms the worst fears. Moreau is dead, leaving Prendick and Montgomery to fend for themselves. Montgomery, devastated by Moreau's death, resorts to heavy drinking with the Beast Folk, which doesn't end well. Montgomery and his assistants are attacked and killed. To make matters worse, Moreau's house is burned down in an accidental fire ignited by a knocked-over lamp, and Prendick learns that the boats have been destroyed to prevent escape. Now alone, Prendick has to establish dominance over the remaining Beast Folk to survive. However, he lacks the intimidating presence of Moreau and must resort to deception, claiming Moreau's existence persists. Over the subsequent months, the Beast Folk progressively revert to their animal instincts, increasing Prendick's fear of losing control. His salvation comes in the form of a dinghy washing ashore with two corpses on board, and after pushing the bodies overboard, Prendick takes the dinghy out to sea, ultimately being rescued by a passing ship. His fear of being labeled insane forces Prendick to keep his horrifying ordeal a secret. This further amplifies the story intrigue, but also has a profound impact on his mental state, driving him towards insanity. Okay, so that's the basic gist of the book, but there's a few more things to note. In the chapter, The Reversion, page 233, the creatures are explicitly described as chimeras, a blend of multiple animals assembled through the cruel procedure of vivisection. They aren't merely transformed versions of the familiar animals we see in zoos. Instead, each beast is a unique amalgamation of different animals, manifesting characteristics of each, such as ursine, feline, or bovine. What's even more disconcerting are the sporadic remnants of humanity they exhibit, such as spontaneous speech, manual dexterity, and pitiful attempts at bipedalism. They are the epitome of grotesque hybridization. What's even crazier is when Prendick, upon being rescued, is hinting at a horrifying possibility that all living beings, including humans, are capable of reverting to a primitive form. His fear reaches such heights that he can't discern whether his rescuers are humans or manipulated creatures appearing human. It points to a broader existential crisis, which leads him to seek help from a mental health specialist who knew Moreau. On page 246, 
the narrative subtly unveils the grander scale of his analogy, the human race. Prendick is troubled by the notion that bestial nature could surge within anyone, and that degradation he witnessed on the island may unfold on a much larger scale in human society. This fear forces Prendick to leave London, a city he now sees as teeming with humans who, in their struggle for survival, reveal their primitive animalistic tendencies. He even draws a parallel between the imitative behavior of the ape man and the ritualistic adherence of churchgoers, interpreting religious dogma as a manifestation of the bestial instinct. Page 247. However, what's truly intriguing is that upon finishing the book, diligent readers are rewarded with a secret hint that ties the narrative to a broader context, a cryptic clue serving as an intellectual treat for the dedicated reader. At the end of the book, there's a note that explains how the chapter where Dr. Moreau explains is actually from a newspaper article released in 1895. Supposedly, this was written by H.G. Wells, but it never says that in the article. But wait, hold on. This comes from the Saturday Review of Politics, Literature, Science and Art, Volume 79, Issue 2047, published January 19th, 1895, and on pages 89-90, through 90, supposedly Wells wrote a scientific article on the limits of individual plasticity. This is not science fiction, yet they use this science article in the island of Dr. Moreau? Wait, so the book is based on older texts for certain, but I'm not even sure if this is H.G. Wells. The writing style is not the same, and there are some interesting differences from the Dr. Moreau Explains chapter. Reading the full scientific journal piece reveals a fascinating perspective. It strongly suggests that Wells was trying to propose a reality based on scientific possibilities rather than merely conjuring up a fantastical story. This revelation could indicate that Wells saw the themes of biological manipulation and transformation in his novel as potential scientific realities, not mere works of science fiction. Quote, the generalizations of heredity may be pushed to extremes, to an almost fanatical fatalism. There are excellent people who have elevated systematic breeding into a creed and adorned it with a propaganda. The hereditary tendency plays, in modern romance, the part of the malignant fairy, and its victims drive through life blighted from the very beginning. It often seems to be tacitly assumed that a living thing is at the utmost nothing more than the complete realization of its birth possibilities and so, heredity becomes confused with theological predestination. But, after all, the birth tendencies are only one set of factors in the making of the living creature. We overlook only too often the fact that a living being may also be regarded as raw material, as something plastic, something that may be shaped and altered, that this, possibly, may be added and that eliminated, and, the organism as a whole developed far beyond its apparent possibilities. We overlook this collateral factor, and so too much of our modern morality becomes mere subservience to natural selection, and we find it not only the discreetest, but wisest course to drive before the wind. Now the suggestion this little article would advance is this, that there is science, and perhaps even more so in history, some sanction for the belief that a living thing might be taken in hand and so molded and modified that at best it would retain scarcely anything of its inherent form and disposition. That the thread of life might be preserved, unimpaired, while shape and mental superstructure were so extensively recast as even to justify or regarding the result as a new variety of being. This proposition is purposely stated here in its barest and most startling form. It is not asserted that the changes affected would change in any way the offspring of such a creature but only the creature itself, as an individual, is capable of such recasting. It may be the facts to be adduced in support of this possibility will strike the reader as being altogether too trivial and familiar for their superstructure, but they are adduced only to establish certain principles, and these principles, which are perfectly established by these small things, have never been shown conclusively to be necessarily limited to these small things. For reasons that it would not be hard to discover, they have in practice been so restricted in the past. But that is the sum of their assured restriction. Now first, how far may the inherent bodily form of an animal be operated upon? 
There are several obvious ways. Amputation, tongue cutting, the surgical removal of a squint, and the excision of organs will occur to the mind at once. In many cases, excisions result in extensive secondary changes, pigmentary disturbances, increase in the secretion of fatty tissue, and a multitude of correlative changes. Then there is a kind of surgical operation in which the making of a false nose, in cases where that feature has been destroyed, in the most familiar example. A flap of skin is cut from the forehead, turned down on the nose, and heals in the new position. This is a new kind of grafting of part of an animal upon itself in a new position. Grafting of freshly obtained material from another animal is also possible, as has been done in the case of teeth for example. Still, more significant are the graftings of skin and bone, cases where the surgeon, despairing of natural healing, places in the middle of the wound pieces of skin snipped from another individual, fragments of bone from a fresh killed animal, and the medical student at once will recall Hunter's cockspur flourishing on the bull's neck. So much for the form. The physiology, the chemical rhythm of the creature, may also be made to undergo an enduring modification, of which V-word and other methods of inoculation with living or dead matters are examples. A similar operation is the transfusion of blood, although in this case the results are more dubious. These are all familiar cases. Less familiar, and probably far more extensive, were the operations of those abominable medieval practitioners who made dwarfs and show monsters, and some vestiges of whose art still remain in the preliminary manipulation of the young mountebank or contortionist. Victor Hugo gives us the account of them, dark and stormy, after his wont in L'Homme Carré, but enough has been said to remind the reader that it is a possible thing to transplant tissue from one part of an animal to another, or from one animal to another, to alter its chemical reactions and methods of growth, to modify the articulation of its limbs, and indeed to change it in its most intimate structure. And yet, this has never been sought as an end and systematically by investigators. Some of such things have been hit upon in the last resort of surgery. Most of the kindred evidence that will recur to the reader's mind has been demonstrated as it were by accident, by criminals, by the breeders of horses and dogs, kinds of untrained men working for their own immediate ends. It is impossible to believe that the last word, or anything near it, of individual modification has been reached. If we can see the justifications of vivisection, we may imagine as possible in the future. Operators armed with antiseptic surgery and a growing perfection in the knowledge of the laws of growth, taking living creatures and molding them into the most amazing forms, and maybe even reviving the monsters of mythology, realizing the fantasies of the taxidermist, his mermaids, and whatnot in flesh and blood. The thing does not stop at a mere physical metamorphosis. In our growing science of hypnotism, we find the promise of a possibility of replacing old inherent instincts by new suggestions, grafting upon or replacing the inherited fixed ideas. Very much indeed of what we call moral education is such an artificial modification and perversion of instinct. Pugnacity is trained into courageous self-sacrifice and suppressed sexuality into pseudo-religious emotion. We've said enough to develop this curious proposition. It may be the set limits of structure and physical capacity are narrower than is here supposed. But as the case stands, this artistic treatment of living things, this molding of the commonplace individual into the beautiful or the grotesque, certainly seems far credible as to merit a place in our minds among the things that may someday be." End quote. Intriguingly, the thought arises, what if H.G. Wells was just a pseudonym, an actor, a facade for something else, perhaps the higher echelons of society, covertly disseminating clandestine knowledge into the public sphere? Such a strategy could serve as a form of karmic protection, obscuring their intentions by presenting the narrative as a speculative future, rather than a recollection of past or current events. But if this scientific transmutation is conceivable now, what's to say it wasn't possible thousands of years ago? Should we dismiss the idea that our ancestors possessed advanced technology, or the understanding of immunosuppressants needed to conduct such manipulations of life forms? 
the ancient societies may have indeed held such profound knowledge, keeping it shrouded in the deepest secrecy due to its profoundly disturbing implications, the molding and sculpting of entirely new life forms. The startling truth hinted at in this narrative thus opens up a vast array of questions, shaking our understanding of history and human capabilities to its core. We'll pause here, and we have much more to say as we'll continue with The Secret of Dr. Moreau in Part 2. What does such an influential novel from the late 19th century, broaching such grotesque topics as potential scientific realities, imply about our culture? Could it be hinting at a secret history of scientific experiments, obscured from our modern understanding? Perhaps even notions such as cloning and the artificial creation of humans have much more antiquated origin than what is conveyed to us through mainstream channels. As unsettling as it might be, the clues tucked away within this story seem to point towards a hidden history of experimentation kept from humanity's awareness. Only by critically reading between the lines can we start to catch a glimpse of what that secret history may have entailed. Let us know your thoughts if you have anything you want to share about H.G. Wells, and the next part of the video will be out soon, so stay tuned. With that, all we can hope is that our minds may be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?